Did you? So it's a family. Family's doing just fine. Welcome back to another episode on your favorite channel, Marvelous Videos. My name is JJ. Hold on to your magical hats, viewers, as we begin this journey through the dimly lit corners of the DC Universe. Today our guide is none other than the trench-coated sorcerer himself, John Constantine. A world where dark magic slithers in the shadows, where demons and sorcery dance a wicked tango, and where one man stands as a beacon against the encroaching darkness, John Constantine, a witty conjurer with a flair for mischief, faces off against a rogue's gallery of foes that would make even the bravest shiver. From demonic messiahs to elemental terrors, these villains bring a storm of powers, mischief and diabolical plans. So fasten your seatbelts for this supernatural saga promises a wickedly magical ride. Now before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. Nurgel. Nurgel, the demon daddy of the Damnation Army, a deity turned demon, as if the divine got mixed up in a bad batch of cosmic brew. Let me take you on a journey through the smoky haze of Nurgel's villainy. Once upon a time, back in 1979, Constantine had a date with Destiny, or rather a date with Disaster. Astra Loke, a poor innocent soul, had a demon hitchhiker named Norfolthing. John, ever the good Samaritan, tried to exorcise the demon. But Oopsie daisy, he messed it up royally. Next thing you know, Nurgal swoops in like the supernatural vulture he is, snatching Astra and sealing their fate in hell. Now let's talk powers. Nurgal's got powers that are beyond praise. He has claws and fangs for that menacing touch, immortality, so he's got all the time in the underworld to cause chaos, superhuman strength, check, wings for that dramatic entrance, double check, magic, oh you betcha. But wait, there's more. Astral projection and dimensional travel. Because commuting in hell's not easy. Healing to keep the fiendish party going. And necromancy for when he's in the mood to play Dr. Frankenstein. Pyrokinesis for a fiery flare and possession to crash the mortal party. So, next time you're flipping through the pages of Constantine's wild adventures and Nurgal shows up, just remember, he's not here for a tea party. He's here to give hell a run for its money. Papa Midnight, the voodoo virtuoso with a knack for the supernatural biz. In a dark, bustling Manhattan where the skyscrapers reach for the stars, there's an underbelly teeming with magic and mischief. There's one man who is the master of all tricks, bad. It all started with a family feud straight out of a Shakespearean drama. Papa Midnight, in his quest for power, did the unthinkable. He turned his own sister, Sedella, into a one-way ticket to hell, the ultimate betrayal. She became a demonic errand girl stealing secrets and doing demon dirty work for her dear brother. Armed with this unholy alliance, Papa Midnight set up shop in the Big Apple, creating a criminal magic empire that could rival the most exclusive nightclubs. He's got connections that make even the Avengers jealous. Okay, maybe not jealous, but you get the point. Once, he sent our hero, John Constantine, witch walking into Hell's neighborhood, like a magical Uber ride straight to the fiery pits. But hey, turns out Hell wasn't so welcoming, and Constantine Constantine managed to escape this not-so-hellish corner, leaving Midnight with a taste of defeat. Did he give up? Heck no. He brushed off that fall from the Empire State Building like it was a mere stumble in the dark. Now let's talk powers. Immortality is his middle name, and Voodoo is his game. Necromancy? Check. This guy could talk to the dead and probably convince them to do the cha-cha. And when it comes to business, he's the Gordon Ramsay of criminal enterprises. Papa Midnight knows how to run a tight ship. A magical one at that. The first one of the fallen. Let me regale you with the tale of the OG bad boy of the underworld, the first of the fallen. Once in the cosmic theater of existence, this dude was God's right hand celestial companion, the angelic BFF. But guess what? He thought God was bonkers and got himself the boot straight down to hell, becoming the original Satan. And it didn't stop there. The first was all about teamwork in the underworld and thought, hey, let's form a club of fallen angels. So he roped in the second and third of the fallen, who turned out to be powerful 
powerful demons in disguise. They formed a triumvirate to keep hell in check. But then along came Lucifer, the big cheese of existence next to God. He was like, move over boys, and took the throne. However, when Lucifer decided to take an extended vacation from damnation duties, the first brushed off his crown and put the Satan sign back on his office door. In this cosmic tug of war, the first played puppeteer with the fate of a potential messiah, using demon shenanigans. But our witty conjurer, John Constantine, had a few tricks. The magician played chess with the devil and managed to outwit him at every turn. The first had a real bone to pick with Constantine. He tormented our hero for ages, trying to make him crack, but Constantine, being the sly fox that he is, always slipped through the devilish cracks. This fallen angel turned devil has got the works. Energy projection, reality alteration, mind control. Heck, he could probably organize a demonic bake sale if he wanted to. Not to mention, he's got the classic devilish touch that can erase demons with a finger snap. And just for fun, he can infect you with diseases like a supernatural flu shot gone wrong. The Golden Boy The Golden Boy, John Constantine's mirror twin brother. That's one sibling rivalry gone supernatural. John Constantine, the whiz with a knack for trouble, had a perfect twin brother lurking in the shadows. The Golden Boy, as he's affectionately known as, was meant to be the Grand Magus, the Merlin of modern times, destined to unite Britain under a magical reign. But fate played a tricky hand, and this golden child met an early demise in the womb. The mystery of his demise spun like a tank spell. Did dear old dad try an abortion that went wrong? Or was it an accidental sibling tangle with an umbilical cord? Either way, the golden boy became a mystery, pulling the strings from beyond the veil. In an alternate reality, this golden boy thrived. Blessed with love and opportunity, he flaunted beauty and health, all while ruling a near-perfect world. Move over, Zeus, there's a new god in town, and his name is Golden Boy. Destiny decided to play poker. The weak, surviving twin, our dear Constantine, faced life struggles with resilience and maybe a dash of sarcasm. Meanwhile, the golden boy, living in a dimension of splendor, met his less than perfect counterpart and couldn't quite grasp the complexities of their dual existence. In a moment of sibling revelation, they connect on a supernatural level, attempting to merge their souls. However, John wasn't exactly thrilled about this soul-swapping adventure. The Golden Boy, with all his grand plans, saw John as a pesky obstacle, manipulating events to exploit his brother's life using synchronicity wave travel. Burr. Burr, the soul-snacking demon with a craving for kitty souls, not cool. Burr, not cool. A demon straight from the depths of hell had a grand plan to climb the hellish corporate ladder. Wondering how? By serving our favorite trench coat wearing occult detective, John Constantine, as an appetizer to the big bad devil, the first of the fallen, to give our hero an extremely tough time. Burr took Cider Eldridge, a poor soul hostage. The demon's wicked bargain? Surrender Constantine own soul and he'd graciously release all the souls of innocent children he had nabbed. Not a fair trade, you say? We agree. But here's where Constantine's wit and cunning kick in. He played the demon at his own twisted game, crafting a clay decoy, a doppelganger of himself to bamboozle Burr. And obviously Burr had to bite the dust. Speaking of powers, Burr's your classic demonic package deal. Possession accelerated healing. He's like a demon wolverine, minus the metal claws. Immortality? Nope. Demons don't age or need to snack. Superhuman strength? It's like Demon Jim Gaines. Superhuman speed? Think Demon Usain Bolt. And shape-shifting, turning heads like a demon supermodel. The Family Man Samuel Morris aka The Family Man is a serial killer with a taste for family-sized horror, but not the kind you'd find in a Sunday night movie. Samuel had a dark start in life, spiraling into madness after a tragic act that saw him kill his own parents. But instead of seeking therapy or taking up pottery as a cathartic hobby, he decided to make it a career of murder. His obsession led him to target other families, either snuffing them out or driving them to tragic ends. He'd collect macabre mementos and auction them off to the highest bidder. But fear not, dear viewers, for John Constantine wasn't about to let this family man ruin everyone's family reunion. He set out to stop this killer spree, facing off against Morris with all the wit and wile he's famous for. 
Oh, and in case you thought this tale couldn't get darker, Morris decided to up the stakes by targeting Constantine's own family, slaying his father in a fit of cruel retaliation. Now, let's talk about abilities, because this guy had a sinister skill set. Think James Bond, but with a flair for family feuds. He was a master of weaponry, like a villainous armory of doom, and when it came to blending in, he could disguise himself better than a chameleon at a masquerade ball. So next time you're at a family gathering, count your blessings that Samuel Morris isn't on the guest list. King of the Vampires Hold on to your garlic, steaks, and maybe a crucifix or two, because we're diving fang first into the domain of the one and only King of the Vampires. Imagine a vampire, but not just any vampire. This is the vampiric VIP, the Grand Pooba of Bloodsuckers, the King of the Vampires himself. You know he means business when he's got a crown made of fangs. Okay, maybe not literally, but he's that regal. Let's talk powers. And oh boy, does he have a stack of cards up his undead sleeve. Vampirism? Check. Enhanced senses? Double check. Immortality? You betcha on your eternal life. The King of the Vampires is basically the Marvel superhero of the vampire world. He's got more powers than a Swiss army knife has gadgets. Let's not forget about the ability to transform into creatures like bats, wolves, or mist. But why does he stand out in the Constantine's rogues gallery? Well, this vampiric bigwig respected our favorite trench coat wearer wearing magic maestro. It's like the cool kids at the supernatural school recognizing Constantine's potential. There was even a chilling invitation left for Constantine, written in blood in his bathroom sink. So, they had a face-to-face, -face, well, more like a face-to-face -face meeting in a cemetery, surrounded by an entourage of undead. It was like a vampire flash mob, but with fewer dance moves and more bloodlust. Constantine, being the wily wizard he is, turned down the offer to become a vampire groupie, sparking a feud that would keep the king haunting Constantine's knights with a vengeance. In the supernatural playground, the king of the vampires isn't just the kingpin. He's the big bad wolf with the fangs to match. Match. Bruharia and Invunche, ready to enter the world of the Bruharia and their creepy creation. The Invunche, it's a secret society of male witches straight out of your worst nightmares, hailing from Patagonia. These Bruharia dudes were not your friendly neighborhood witches, brewing Eye of Todd in a boiler. No sir, their initiation process made pledging a fraternity look like a walk in the park. First, you had to stand under a waterfall for 40 days and nights, then came the skull-catching ceremony ceremony which, believe it or not, involved a tricorn hat and some serious aim. Oh, and the final initiation phase? Murdering your bestie. Yep, you heard that right. That's not all. These witches had killer fashion sense. Literally, they fashioned waistcoats out of human skin and fat. The Invunche is their pet project of horror. It's a creature with a head on the back and limbs all out of joint, straight out of a Picasso painting gone wrong. This monstrosity was their secret weapon. Their guardian of the cave and an assassin rolled into one creepy package. How do they create this nightmare? Kidnap a six-month-old infant, dismember it, and add a sprinkle of mystical mayhem. Voila! Instant in voce. Their ultimate goal? No small feat. They aimed to obliterate heaven. They wanted to unleash the primordial darkness, the stuff that existed before God. And they weren't just twiddling their thumbs. They plotted and schemed, manipulating events to make humanity believe in all things dark and spooky. John Constantine knew the Bruharia's game, and they knew he knew. They conjured up the Invunche to mess with Constantine's crew, leaving a trail of death and terror in its wake. But fear not, for Constantine wasn't one to be caught in a demonic death grip. He faced the Invunche head-on, standing strong against its terror. The battle was intense, but our hero wasn't about to let these supernatural baddies win. The Bruharia's plan to plunge the world into darkness was about to face a major plot twist, courtesy of Constantine. Gabriel, Gabriel Hornblower, the fallen angel with a name so majestic, it's almost as if he's moonlighting as a knight at a renaissance fair. He was once a top tier, demiurgic archangel up there in the heavens. He was like the superstar of the angelic world, God's favorite, and all that jazz. You see, Gabriel's angelic, high-flying days took a nosedive when he decided to take a romantic detour to the dark side. Yep, he went on a hot date with a demon. This spicy little escapade was all part of John Con 
Constantine's grand plan, cooked up because Gabriel refused to lend a heavenly hand with Constantine's lung cancer. Gabriel's celestial resume took a hit with this demon dalliance, and he went from angelic VIP to a fallen angel special. Stripped of his wings, hold your gasps, even his heart. Now fueled by rage and a dash of righteous vengeance, Gabriel went on a mission to wreak havoc, giving Constantine a hard time forever. So next time you're strolling through the pearly gates or the fiery pits, keep an eye out for Gabriel Hornblower. Neron Neron is a supreme overlord of the infernal realm. He's like the CEO of hell, but with a twist of magic and his art of soul snatching. So Neron, the evil incarnate and ruler of hell, had this devilish plan to take over New York City and then the whole wide world. Ambitious, isn't it? Oh yeah. And it definitely put him on John Constantine's naughty list. To give you a taste of his wicked prowess, Neron loves feasting on the innocence of children. Yep, he's that kind of monster. He's got the whole demonic package. Energy blasts that could rival a sci-fi laser show, flight to sweep you off your feet, literally, and immortal status. Oh, and did I mention he's a sorcerer too? Neron's bag of tricks includes pyrokinesis, thermal blast, telekinesis, and teleportation. This demon's got more moves than a pop star on tour. In a showdown with Constantine, Neron tried to hex the Brit into submission. But hey, Constantine's got it under control. With a little help and a lot of wit, our hero dismissed mantle Neron's diabolical plans and sent him back to the fiery pits without a crown to show for it. Drummond Drummond, the dastardly doggone demon. Drummond, or as we like to call him the canine cannibal cop, started his career as a corrupt police officer. He must have watched one too many canine cop movies. But instead of partnering up with a trusty German shepherd, he decided to take matters into his own paws. Quite literally, this guy had a real bone to pick with the world. After a less than illustrious career in law enforcement, Drummond sought immortality in all the wrong places. Armed with a grimoire, the mystical book of bad ideas. He aimed to transfer his consciousness into another body. However, it seems Drummond missed the memo on good hosts for Possession 101. He failed at the human possession game and ended up in the body of a bulldog. In his bulldog form, Drummond became a true top dog in the worst sense. He forced a poor human boy to fetch victims for him, devour them, and even convince the boy to snack on the scraps. The only thing missing was a side of fries. To make matters worse, he built a whole army of canine cronies to win wage war against humanity. Clearly, he missed the memo that Fetch is meant to be a fun game, not a horror show. Constantine, always the alpha in any situation, faced off against this four-legged friend. Drummond underestimated Constantine, thinking he'd be the top dog, but John had a few tricks as well. In a hilarious twist, Constantine used Pepper to give Drummond a sneezing fit. It's the ultimate weapon in any battle against bulldog foes, right? Our trench coat clad hero seized the opportunity, wielding a monkey wrench and proving that even a talking dog can't escape a good old-fashioned beatdown. Great Darkness When the creator said let there be light, the Great Darkness decided to take a nap and let the light have its moment in the spotlight. In the beginning, before superheroes had even picked out their capes and spandex, there was the Great Darkness chilling in the primordial void, minding its own business. But when the light started hogging the cosmic stage, the darkness couldn't help but throw a tantrum, birthing the entire multiverse in protest. Fast forward to the crisis on infinite Earths, a real page Turner in the Cosmic Saga, a cult called the Bruharia, thought it was a brilliant idea to wake the Great Darkness from its beauty sleep, aiming to destroy God and redesign reality. John Constantine and the Swamp Thing formed their own cosmic buddy cop duo to oppose this fiendish awakening. Things got complicated with supernatural heroes, angelic armies, demonic factions, and even anti-monitor getting involved. It was a multiverse-sized showdown, and the darkness learned a lot from it. Etrigan taught it about being evil, Dr. Fate preached about the horrors of despicability, and the Spectre schooled it on the fine art of revenge. The darkness didn't just want to obliterate everything, it craved to engage with the light above, wanting to witness the epic stories of the multiverse. Now, as much as the great darkness may seem like the ultimate party pooper, it just wanted to be part of the cosmic shindig. However, it also had a corrupted fragment that was up to no good. 
influencing beings like Darkseid and causing a ruckus in the Infinite Crisis. In the end, the Great Darkness turned out to be a misunderstood entity, just seeking to end everything but merely wanting to be part of the Universal Tale. Just imagine being that big entity in the sky, wanting a front row seat to the cosmic drama. Who knew darkness had FOMO too? Demon Constantine John Constantine had a case of double trouble, and I'm not talking about espresso shots. Nope, he cooked up a magical clone of himself using a pinch of clay, a dash of Aleister Crowley's essence, and a splash of demon blood, and topped it off with the least desirable bits of his personality. Demon Constantine was born, and boy was he a handful. Now this demonic doppelganger was like John Constantine, with the volume cranked up to 11. Possession? Check. Accelerated healing? Double check. Immortality? Oh, you bet. Superhuman strength and speed? Yep, he had those two. This devilish twin was initially cooked up as part of a cunning plan to outsmart Burr, a demon with an appetite for chaos. In the process, the demon clone met its maker, literally. But the trouble was far from over. Separated from the spirit of Aleister Crowley, this rogue demon decided to break free from its clay mold and become the wandering menace that haunted John Constantine's nightmares for years to come. Nicholas Nolan Nicholas Edgar Nolan, or as the magical town knows him, Nick Necro, is a sorcerer whose love for magic is only rivaled by his obsession with the books of magic. Nick wasn't your average Joe from down the street. No sir, his family's profession might have been plain seamstress and plumber, but he had his sights on the supernatural. Magic whispered its secrets to him, promising an escape from mundane life. He delved into the mystical arts, learning from the best, including the likes of Zatar and Baron Winters. But Nick wasn't content with just parlor tricks and magic shows. He hungered for ultimate knowledge, and that craving led him down a dark path, straight to the mythical books of magic. Rumored to hold the universe's secrets and the source of all magic, these books became the apple of Nick's eye, even driving a wedge between him, Zatanna, and John Constantine. He wielded powers that could make a learned magician nervous. Possession? Yep. Accelerated healing? Oh, you bet. Electrokinesis and power absorption? Check and check. And let's not forget his mastery of black magic and the dark arts. But things took a sour turn as his obsession with the books of magic grew stronger leading him to make a deal with the Cult of the Cold Flame, leaving John and Zatanna in the cold, caught in a trap set by their former mentor. In a twist of fate, Nick's lust for power led to his downfall. He was dragged to hell, leaving John and Zatanna to pick up the pieces. But the magical world is never without its surprises, and Nick clawed his way back, teaming up with some wicked characters to go after the books of magic once more. Lucifer, Lucifer, the original bad boy, is the devil himself. You've seen him portrayed by Peter Stormare. Lucifer, once the head honcho angel in God's celestial lineup, got the ticket to Hotel Hell. He's like the Chuck Norris of the underworld. First off, he's got the I'm not getting older card, yep, immortality. Aging, diseases, death, not in his demonic job description. Then, there is a superhuman strength. He could arm wrestle a grizzly bear and probably win. And if you thought traffic was bad, he's got teleportation and interdimensional travel on speed dial, making rush hour look like a leisurely Sunday drive. But wait, there's more. He is the master illusionist, making reality his own personal playground. You'll believe it's raining cats and dogs if he says so. And if you ever wanted a wish granted, move over, genies. Lucifer has got that covered too. And just when you thought you'd seen it all, he's got the other ultimate trick, resurrection. Lazarus would be jealous. Lucifer's backstory is a cosmic drama. He was God's A-list archangel, but something made him fall from grace like a rock star off a stage. Now he's got a penthouse in hell and a feud with the big man upstairs for the souls of mankind. And guess who's on the VIP list for Lucifer's soul collection? John Constantine. Yep, the devil's got a reserved spot with Constantine's name on it. Who said you couldn't plan ahead? for the afterlife. Balthazar Balthazar, the demon with the face that only a mother or maybe another demon could love. He's the snarkiest, most mischievous guy you would know. In his human form, you will find him strutting around in a blue suit like he's auditioning for Demon's Got Talent. But hold on, he's got a knack for fashion disasters. His ties never match his outfit. It's like he's got a personal vendetta against good taste. But don't be fooled by his human disguise when Balthazar unleashes his demon form. It's 
it's like someone painted him with an unpleasant shade of green. Now, let's talk personality. Balthazar is just like that annoying kid in school who loved to pull pranks and laugh at your misfortune. Sadistic, cruel, and a fan of causing trouble. Especially if it's John Constantine's day that needs ruining. Oh, and the guy enjoys a good killing spree. Especially if it hurts Constantine emotionally. When it comes to powers, Balthazar's got a whole demonic arsenal. Superhuman strength, superhuman durability, etc. He can influence you with just a whisper, turning your favorite song into a cacophony of chaos. But for all his demonic might, he's not exactly a strategic genius. Traps, tricks, and misdirection, not his strong suit. He's the demon with a bad tie and an even worse attitude, ready to turn your day into a demonic roller coaster. Felix Faust. This guy didn't just fall off the bad guy wagon, he did a triple flip off the diving board of dark arts. A dude so evil, he made the devil raise an eyebrow and say, dang son, that's cold. Faust was a sorcerer with a thirst for knowledge that could make a librarian blush. He made a literal deal with the devil. Yes, you heard that right, not a metaphorical one, making him as immortal as a cockroach in a nuclear apocalypse. Aging? Forget about it. This guy's got the skin of a baby that sold its soul. Now, the Justice League has had the pleasure of crossing paths with Faust, Richie Simpson, the brain behind some plan involving the Dreamstone and the Demons 3, decided to play the ultimate poker game. Faust got roped into this magical poker night, and let's just say the stakes were high. This wasn't your average game night, folks. Faust ended up conjuring a demonic tornado and a golem made from, of all things, restroom refuse. Yep, you heard me right, a poop golem. In the ultimate showdown, Zatanna, one of the league's magical powerhouses, took the spotlight. She unleashed a storm of spells and summoned a giant sword ready to make Faust's day go from bad to worse. But wait, Constantine stepped in. He reminded Zatanna to keep her cool, and just like that, Faust was spared from a giant magical skewering. In the end, Faust turned out to be a pawn in a much grander scheme orchestrated by Richie Simpson. The League figured it out and saved the day, but not before exposing Faust's magical meddling. Trigon. Trigon, the cosmic deadbeat dad you never want to have a family reunion with. Trigon's the kind of guy who brings chaos and destruction to a whole new level. He's so sinister, even the devil probably checks under his bed for Trigon before going to sleep. He's got this contract thing going on with John Constantine, exchanging tidbits about his daughter Raven. You know, father-daughter bonding, demon style. But little did he know, Constantine was double-crossing him faster than you can say abracadabra. Classic Constantine moves right there. Trigon's got the demon deluxe package, flight, dimension hopping, magic, and a talent for toasting things with his fiery hellfire. He's got the whole invincibility thing going on, making him practically immune to anything that isn't on par with cosmic chaos. The Damnation Army the Damnation Army, or as I like to call them, the not-so-friendly neighborhood cult club. A demon named Nergal decides, you know what would be a great idea? An evil army of souls who are down to cause some mayhem and hand out the worst party invitations ever. And that's basically how the Damnation Army got its start. These guys were like the Avengers of the Underworld. But you know, if the Avengers were on a team-building retreat in the fiery pits of hell, their main gig? Taking down London, one sinister act at a time. Nergal, the demon ringleader, had a not so small obsession with everyone's favorite trench coat fellow, John Constantine. He wasn't content with just defeating him. Oh no, Nergal wanted Constantine on his team. Like we discussed earlier, Constantine refused. Iron Fist was sent on a mission to find Constantine, and unsurprisingly, chaos ensued. There was a whole showdown at Zed's place, and Iron Fist was about as friendly as a porcupine at a balloon party. Unfortunately, John's quick thinking convinced Iron Fist to play the self-destruct card saving the day and giving John and Zed the chance to do what they do best, escape the madness. 
Destiny. Destiny, the sorcerer who probably got his start reading all the wrong kinds of bedtime stories. You know, the ones that give kids nightmares and have them begging for a nightlight. Destiny was one twisted wizard, the kind who made Merlin roll his eyes. Back in Arthurian times, Destiny was a man of science turned mad scientist. But instead of creating an evil robot or a doomsday device, he decided to play with the Dreamstone. Imagine it's like the Infinity Gauntlet, but more nightmarish and with a much scarier color scheme. With this dreamstone in hand, Destiny went on a fear-fueled spree, making townsfolk live their worst nightmares. Merlin had to pull out the big guns, quite literally, and unleash Etrigan to deal with this menace. Etrigan was like the ultimate pest control, banishing Destiny's soul into the accursed dreamstone. Fast forward to modern times, the Destiny was at it again. This time, he made a shady deal with John Constantine's buddy Richie Simpson, offering immortality in exchange for a bit of chaos. Classic villain move, right? Destiny saw a loophole in their little contract and decided to possess Richie, causing all sorts of mayhem in the city. He thought he was the hotshot in town, defeating Swamp Thing and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Etrigan. But Constantine and his spectral sidekick Deadman weren't having any of it. They teamed up and served Destiny a big old can of whoop. Mystical whoop, that is. Cult of the Cold Flame The Cult of the Cold Flame is a bunch of magicians who clearly missed the memo about not playing with dark magic. This happened when Sargon the Sorcerer, Zatara, Mr. E, and Tanarak were all huddling together thinking, you know what this world needs? An exclusive club for evil sorcery enthusiasts. These magicians had delusions of grandeur, thinking they could assemble a cult and rule the world. It's like they wanted to be the Simon Cowell of the mystical realm. Well, except Simon doesn't usually dabble in world dominance. Last time I checked, at first it was all rainbows and unicorns in the cult, with their ambition reaching the heavens. But like any good reality TV show, drama soon unfolded. Zatara was the first to go, ditching the cult like it was a sinking ship. In the present day, Constantine had declared war on the cold flame. He saw them as his arch nemesis, the Joker to his Batman, the Loki to his Thor. You get the idea. Things got spicy when Constantine defeated Mr. E with the Moonblade and decided to play double agent. He snuck into the cult, pretending to be one of them. Unfortunately, his plan hit a roadblock, causing casualties and leaving only two cult leaders standing. In the grand scheme of things, the cult of the Cold Flame was like a magical roller coaster, full of ups and downs and enough twists to make your head spin. Iron Fist the Avenger Ah! <sighs> Iron Fist the Avenger, a creature with a serious identity crisis, brought to you by the demon Nergal's creativity, a lack thereof. It's a mishmash of four British boys, each contributing their bit to this monstrous buffet of limbs and heads. This beastie was a powerhouse, armed with more arms and heads than your average Hydra. It was designed with a singular mission to hunt down John Constantine. Yep, Nergal had a bone to pick with our snarky magician, but leave it to Constantine. Constantine to pull off a trick that even Houdini would applaud. Our wily hero swiftly saw through the monster's facade. How? Oh, just by pointing out the hilarious fact that the creature had allegiances to both Chelsea FC and Arsenal FC, two rival football clubs. It's like having a Yankees cap and a Red Sox cap at the same time. You just can't pick both sides. The poor creature found itself in a major sports dilemma unsure which side of the pitch to root for. In the ultimate act of football-induced frustration, it decided to end its own game and called it quits. In the end, Iron Fist the Avenger was a tragic case of divided loyalties and a glaring example of why being a sports fan and a demonic fusion experiment don't mix well. Triskel. Triskel. Ah, she's not your typical demon. Nope, she's the worm queen of the succubi, which, let's be honest, already sounds like a title you wouldn't want on your business card. This wicked queen took her quest for a fashionable face to a whole new level. Ever heard of Face Off? Well, she's played it for real and tore off the face of an archangel named Daryl. The infamous First of the Fallen needed help to catch Constantine's soul, and Triskel was the one he turned to. Their plan, snag a powerful witch named Chantanel. However, things went south and John Constantine, being his usual sly self, ruined their day, and Triskel ended up as Hell's tragic head-on-a-spike decoration. Oh, and she's not just a face dealer. Triskel's got a magical toolkit to envy. Curses, 
soul control, reality alterations, and a knack for granting wishes. At a soulful cost, of course. Plus, she's got the ultimate frequent flyer perk, zipping in and out of hell like it's her personal demonic playground. In summary, Triskel is not someone you'd want to bump into a dark alley, or you know, in any alley, or anywhere. Really, just stay away, far, far away. Lamashtu Lamashtu, the demon goddess of hell and one of the sisters of Eve, is like that creepy ex you just can't escape. God initially made her and her sisters potential matches for Adam, hoping for some divine marital bliss. But guess what? Only Eve was up for the job. The others had different plans, like joining the first of the fallen and becoming demonic goddesses of hell. Now, during the whole Rising Darkness drama, the Bruharia, which is basically a dark magic squad, decided to hire Lamashtu for some evil babysitter sitting gig. She disguised herself as Sister Louisa in a church, probably to catch up on some missed Sunday school. But in reality, she was there to feast on newborns and slurp up their precious life energy. John Constantine, the ultimate baby whisperer, caught wind of this nefarious plot and swooped in with the icon of Pazuzu to stop her dead in her demon tracks. Lamashtu, like any demon worth their hellfire, has an impressive skill set. We're talking immortality, shape-shifting like a supernatural chameleon, casting illusions that can make David Copperfield jealous, and draining the life energy out of babies. Super strength and speed are also on her demon resume. And hey, she's multilingual, a demon of many talents indeed. Mammon Mammon the demon with daddy issues So Mammon is a spawn of Lucifer, making him the Prince of Darkness Jr. You know the guy who thought creating his own kingdom on Earth was a nifty idea? To make his evil Earth-conquering dreams come true, he needed a psychic powerhouse. Someone should power up his demonic invasion like an otherworldly power bank. Powers, oh boy. Hold on to your enchanted hats. Being Lucifer's offspring isn't a walk in the park. Mammon is basically the demon boss you don't want to mess with. Humans, magic, little demons, you name it. They can't scratch him. He's the high prince of the seven princes of hell in the film realm. And only dear old dad Lucifer is stronger. But let's be real. Even with all his demonic power, Mammon is no match for the big guns. God, the archangels, and of course Constantine and his bag of clever tricks. Sorry, Mammon, but you're just a demon in a world of heavenly power plays and Constantine's sassy one-liners. Astra Logue Astra Logue, the girl who had a rougher childhood than a Pikachu, lost herself in the tall grass. She went through botched exorcism, was hellbound, raised by the fates, and was cursed to have a pretty complex life. Our girl was damned to the fiery pits of hell at a tender age thanks to a not-so-great exorcism attempt by her pal, John Constantine. She ends up in the hands of Lachesis, fate extraordinaire who decides to play puppeteer with Astra's soul. Fast forward to when Hell gets new management. Neron takes the helm, and Astra has plans. Oh yes, diabolical plans. She's got her eye on expanding her evil armies by snatching up 18 wicked souls, aiming to become the queen of Hell and give Constantine a taste of his own medicine. Revenge served extra spicy. Constantine and the legends decide to throw a wrench in her wicked ski. When she tried to mess with Constantine's soul, he did the unexpected and offered to help her. They even had a heartfelt moment. But guess what? Betrayal was on the menu, and Atropos served it up cold, ending poor Astra. As for powers, Astra's got quite the magical toolkit. Transformation, telepathy, pyrokinesis, yep, fire bending like a pro, astral projection, and she can even play with souls. She's like the Swiss army knife of the magical realm. Plus, she knows how to pull off a good deception and lead her own supernatural squad. Jaminy Sargent Jaminy Sargent, the magical family tree, got a few extra branches with this one. She's the daughter of the OG Sargon the Sorcerer, which practically makes her magical royalty. She's part of the inner circle of the Cult of the Cold Flame, the kind of group that probably has their meetings in a shadowy room with a no non-magicians allowed sign on the door. Jaminy had her eyes set on Croydon's Compass, a mystical GPS for magical power sources. She wanted to gather all the pieces, starting with the compass needle. But guess who else had their sights on it? Our boy Constantine. Of course. Hence it's time for a magical tug of war. In the process of this hide and seek, she had a not so friendly encounter with Constantine, resulting in a very unfortunate fate for John's friend Chris. The cult of the cold flame steals all of Constantine's magical goodies. And Jaminy, now supercharged with power, gives him an ultimatum. Join us and we'll give you a free wand. 
Constantine being Constantine plays along with his own motives. She also pulls off a mastermind move, orchestrating a showdown between Constantine and Mr. E. She's basically the puppeteer of the magical puppet show. Nameth, this dude, or well, this hunger spirit, is like the ultimate party crasher. But for your stomach, he's a demon that thrives on cravings. Nameth feeds on humanity's insatiable desires. And no, we're not just talking about the 3 a.m. cravings for tacos. We're talking about all of it. Food, fear, and everything else. Back in the late 1980s, when famine hit parts of Africa hard, Nameth saw this as prime time to make its debut on Earth. It took over a young suitor boy like some sinister parasite and feasted on his starving body. A Dinkin shaman tried to exorcise the demon but failed, resulting in a last-ditch effort to contain Nemeth within the boy. Power patterns of binding were carved into the boy's face. It was painful, yes, but it worked. Nemeth was trapped at least for a while. Fast forward to the chaos of 1987 in New York City. An amateur conjurer named Gary Lester found the trapped demon in a bottle and decided to play a supernatural hero by attempting an exorcism. Long story short, things went south, and the boy's death was the grim outcome. But oh no, Nemeth wasn't done causing havoc. Released from the bottle, it spread like wildfire, infecting people with an insatiable hunger. People started devouring everything in sight. Food, non-food, even comic books. Then came the savior, our main man, John Constantine. He teamed up with voodoo crime lord Papa Midnight to find a way to contain Nemeth, and they did something unexpected. They used used Gary Lester, who was dying from his own addiction, as a host for Nemeth, effectively trapping the hunger demon once again. Gary may have died, but he became the ultimate demon trap, keeping Nemeth from wreaking havoc on the earthly plane. Norful Thing Norful Thing, the demon who is the life of the party, if that party is a terrifying nightmare, a creature that's like a mishmash of a dog, a monkey, and your worst fever dream. He has all his internal organs on display, strutting around like it's a fashion statement. This demon isn't your run-of-the-mill summon, command, and bind kind of fiend. Oh no, it's a terror elemental, the type that pulls a trick out of your subconscious nightmares and makes it a horrifying reality. Its origin story is as dark and twisted as the demon itself. Amateur occultist Alex Logue held some dark rituals in the basement of his club, the Casanova Club. He dragged his young daughter Astra into the mess, traumatizing her to the point where her subconscious summoned the Norful Thing to protect her. And protect her it did, in the worst possible way. The Norful Thing goes on a slaughter spree, sparing only Astra. As we know, John Constantine and his squad of supernatural sidekicks, aka the Newcastle crew, they stumble upon this horror show in the basement. Mr. E. Mr. E, the guy with a serious case of, should have gone to Specsavers if you catch my drift. A guy who was once a magic-wielding superhero, but then had a little accident and lost his eyes. But did that stop him from becoming a magical powerhouse? Not even close. He's like the magician version of the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. In his case, when life takes your eyes, he says, well, I'll just see things from a different perspective. Mr. E went from good to I'm wearing the darkest shade of black as he embraced the dark side of magic. He even co-founded the Cult of the Cold Flame, where they aimed to gather an army of magic wielders to do their bidding. I guess they were aiming for a kind of magical bake-off, but with a lot more sinister ingredients. At some point, Mr. E was part of this crew called the Trench Code Brigade, which sounds like something out of a 90s boy band fever dream. They were like the Avengers of Magic, guiding a young lad named Tim Hunter through the magical realms and ages. Sort of like a twisted magical school field trip, but with more danger and fewer permission slips. Now, when it comes to his beef with John Constantine, let's just say they weren't sharing magical muffin recipes. E and his cult wanted to steal Constantine's magical stash. They absorbed all the magical power, but Constantine wasn't having it. In a showdown hotter than a jalapeno on a summer day, Constantine defeated E and absorbed his soul into the Moonblade. Nahash. Meet Nahash, the original slithering superstar from the Garden of Eden. Yep, that's right. Nahash is like the OG snake in the grass. But this isn't your ordinary garden variety snake. We're talking demon vibes here. In the 21st century, Nahash decided to shed its snake skin and rock the human look. Going by the name Vicente, it's like that classic tale of the snake trying to fit into a human society. Only this snake had some seriously shady motives. Nahash got in cahoots with Bruheria. They sent Nahash on a mission to make 
life miserable for none other than our favorite magician John Constantine. Nehash slithered its way to Mexico City with murder on its mind, aiming to give Constantine a ride to the afterlife. But hold on, because Sister Anne-Marie Flynn, a nun with a furba dagger, wasn't having any of it. She pulled off a move and gave Nehash a stab he would never forget. The dagger met its mark, and Nehash's body turned into a wriggling pile of snakes faster than you can say his stir Constantine. Yep, Nehash got a taste of its own slithery medicine. Adam Constantine Ready to unveil the twisted family tree of the Constantine clan? Adam Constantine is one branch you won't find on any genealogy chart. So, Adam Constantine. Yep, you guessed it, a relative of the infamous John Constantine. But this family connection isn't all warm and fuzzy holiday gatherings. Adam was cooked up in a cauldron of dark magic and family vendettas. Adam had quite the diabolical origin story. He's one of the demonic messiahs, born from the union of Rosa Carnes and John Constantine. Now, Rosa Carnes, being the charming mother she was, handed Adam a mission with a bow on top, destroy everything Constantine held dear. But as fate would have it, after the demise of dear old mom Rosa Carnes, Adam and his brother Saul tried to strike a deal with the first of the fallen to spare their demonic lives. It's like making a pact with the devil, but well, in this case, it's exactly like making a pact with the devil. Now, let's talk powers. Adam was packing some serious, supernatural heat, magic, mind control, or telekinesis, all checkmate, illusion casting, you bet, fear projection and summoning, double check and triple check. The guy had an occult toolbox that would make even Merlin jealous. He could probably pull a rabbit out of a hat, make it a dragon and then make the dragon sing show tunes. Timothy Hunter Timothy Hunter is the young wizard with a dash of potential and a sprinkle of uncertainty, a British youth with a likeness for magic. Now, young Timmy wasn't your average Hogwarts student. Nope, he had more magical potential than a cauldron full of Felix Felicis, good, evil, or as undecided as a chameleon at a color factory. Tim was a hot topic among the mystical elite. The Trench Code Brigade, featuring magical heavyweights like the Phantom Stranger, John Constantine, Richard Occult, and Mr. E, decided to give Timmy a grand tour of the magical side of the DC Universe. In this enchanted adventure, Timmy made friends and tiptoed dangerously close to the dark side of magic. But oh boy, did things take a turn. Imagine that 15 years down the magical road, Tim went from potential goody two-shoes to leading the magical villains of the DC Universe in an epic magical showdown. Timmy had sorcery skills that could rival Merlin on a good day. He was basically the Gandalf of the DC world minus the epic beard. Elder Martin Elder Martin, the maestro of mayhem and the leader of the Resurrection Crusade, a group that makes you question if they got lost on their way to a medieval fair. He was a daddy to Zed, whom the Crusade had some serious celestial plans for, dubbing her the Mary. It's like the Crusade thought they hit the celestial jackpot with Zed, the chosen one of their peculiar clubs. Elder Martin is his evil lair, a lair complete with skulls probably, led a splinter group of the Crusaders known as the Tongues of Fire. They weren't aspiring rock stars. They were hardcore enforcers out to make their mark in the world of mystical shenanigans. Resurrection Crusade Resurrection Crusade, an American group so fanatical, makes fandom debates look like casual brunch conversations. These folks were all about the sin bashing game, aiming to give people a taste of their own so-called sinful medicine. And oh boy, were they convinced they were the judges, jury, and executioners of morality. Their claim to fame, the pyramid of prayer videos, their leader, Elder Martin, was like the Gandalf of fanaticism, except instead of saying you shall not pass, he was more of a repent or face the consequences kind of guy. Their grand plan? To cook up a new messiah. Yes, you heard that right. Their recipe? Have Elder Martin's daughter Mary, whom they believed was the Mary from biblical fame, do the deed with an angel aiming for a godchild as a result. The crusade thought they were crafting the sequel to the divine story, but instead they got a plot twist that even M. Night Shyamalan could not have predicted. Here's where John Constantine steps into the ring to foil their plans. He stood firm against their biblical ambitions, but not without a twist. You see, Zed, Elder Martin's daughter, had a fling with Constantine, and it wasn't exactly an angelic encounter. It was more of a demon essence kind of affair. As you can guess, Heaven didn't RSVP to this unholy union, and they were not amused. 
Maria Constantine. Maria Constantine, the black sheep of the Constantine demonic. The family reunions in the Constantine clan probably get a bit heated. What with magical messiahs and dark secrets. Maria, one of the wicked progeny of John Constantine and the mysterious Rosa Carnes, wasn't your ordinary daughter. Nope, she had a special motherly mission to knock off Constantine's loved ones. However, as Maria grew, she started having those existential crises we all have at some point. Only hers was on a whole supernatural level. She began questioning her own existence, wondering if her childhood was just one big magical illusion. Now let's not forget about her powers. Maria wasn't exactly slacking in that department. Magic? Check. Mind control? Oh, absolutely. She could make people doze off faster than a boring history lecture. Necromancy? Sure thing. She purified souls like a supernatural laundry service. Except for souls, not socks. And let's not overlook telekinesis and teleportation. Because who wants to walk when you can just magically zip around? In a family where magic and mystery run amok, Maria stood out as a rebel with a cause to survive the wrath of the first of the fallen. Rosa Carnes. Rosa Carnes is the daughter of Nergal and a real maestro of dream manipulation. She's like the Freddy Krueger of the demon world, but with a more twisted family agenda. Imagine pulling a fast one on John Constantine himself and tricking him into unwittingly fathering not one, not two, but three demonic messiahs. So Rosa Carnes used her dreamy talents to lure Constantine into a nightmarish affair, resulting in the unholy trinity, Adam, Saul, and Maria, and these devilish tots. They they were meant to be Constantine's worst nightmare, sent to wreak havoc on everything he held dear. But like any good drama, this tale had a twist. The first of the fallen, the big boss demon, decided he'd had enough of Rosa Carnes' shenanigans. Threatening Constantine's life was a no-go zone, even in the demonic underworld. So the first of the fallen brought the curtains down on Rosa Carnes, ending her villainous act. As for powers, Rosa Carnes had the whole demonic circus going on. Magic? Check. Astral projection? you got it. Dream Conjuring She could trap you in a snooze fest of a dream. Chronic Kinesis Yep, she could fast forward your dream like it's the ultimate Netflix binge. Metamorphosis Shape shifting at its finest. Pyrokinesis Toasty Reality alteration She played with the universe like a cosmic etch-a-sketch. Telepathy Implanted false memories like a supernatural version of the men in black, making sure her demon offspring stayed in the dark about their origins. Graceful Moon Graceful Moon, the luck-stealing wizard with a bone to pick. A Chinese magician who's all about luck but with a serious grudge on the side, like she's holding a five-leaf clover of revenge. She started her magical journey under the not-so-nurturing wings of Mr. E, who taught her a spell that tragically wiped out her family. Abracadabra, family gone. Understandably, she wasn't too thrilled about this initiation into the magical world. Fast forward, she developed a fierce vendetta against E and the sinister cult of the coal flame, John Constantine. In his curious quest to dig up dirt about his magical past, decided to knock on Graceful Moon's mystical door. But oh boy, did he get more than he bargained for. Their meeting was less Marvel team-up and more civil war, as Moon unleashed her luck-stealing prowess, trying to make Constantine's fortune run dry. Their battle was so epic it practically leveled the joint they were in, and in this supernatural showdown, Graceful Moon met her unlucky fate. She got caught in the crossfire and was reduced to magical rubble. The Beast The Beast, original master of disguise like the ultimate shapeshifter. Back in the Garden of Eden days when Adam was handing out names to all the animals, the Beast pulled a sneaky move and managed to dodge a name. Imagine being the ultimate identity thief, thanks to an unscheduled absence from Adam's name-calling party. No name meant no fixed form, allowing the Beast to be the ultimate cosmic chameleon. This shifty creature tailed Adam and the family out of Eden, not for a friendly chat, but to cause some serious family drama. God created another being, the Shadow Dog, to protect us from the shape-shifting menace. But things got twisted. People started blaming the dog for the beast's bad deeds. Fast forward to modern times, where during a mission, Constantine unintentionally unleashed the beast. While dealing with this whole Shadow Dog situation, the beast found itself a comfy home in Jason, who happened to be Angie Spatchcock's brother. Once unleashed, this shape-shifting trickster played mind games on a global scale 
Mind control? Check. Stirring emotions like a cosmic DJ at a galactic rave? Absolutely. The Beast was like the ultimate puppeteer, pulling humanity's strings and turning us all into marionettes of chaos. Things got so out of hand, it was like the universe's version of a wild party gone wrong. But fear not, our ragtag team of heroes, including Constantine, the Swamp Thing, and more, wasn't about to let the Beast ruin the whole universe's vibe. With a bit of magical mojo and a whole lot of determination, they resurrected the shadow dog from humanity's collective unconscious and let the fur fly. In a climactic battle, the shadow dog finally sank its teeth into the beast problem and brought it down for good, saving the day and restoring some order to the supernatural chaos. Stercorax. Stercorax, the demon with the skin of steel. He's like the superhero of invincibility, with a skin that's tough to crack. This demon had some serious sibling rivalry going on. While his brother was off on vacation or something, Stercorax saw an opportunity to seize power in Gehenna. His plan? To take down Rosa Carnes and become the new big bad boss of the demon realm. However, Rosa Carnes wasn't about to let her throne slip through her demonic fingers. She outwitted Stercorax, luring him into a trap of poison flesh. Yep, she served him a not-so-delicious dish of doom. Stercorax chowed down unsuspectingly and, well, let's just say it wasn't a pleasant meal. The poison took him out of commission and he was down for the count, writhing in discomfort. To make sure he stayed down for the long haul, Rosa Carnes decided to have some fun. She ordered her crew to keep dribbling poison down his throat, just to keep him in check. It's like an eternal game of demon whack-a-mole, but with poison instead of mallets. This demon wasn't your average pincushion. He had a skin of steel, making him the ultimate in durability. No weapon or magic could scratch the surface, but as fate would have it, his Achilles heel wasn't his skin but what was inside. So while Stercorax may have thought he was invincible with this tough exterior, a little poison and a clever demon queen proved that even the mightiest have a weakness. Tanarak. Tanarak, the Sorcerer Supreme and Master of Magical Mayhem. Tanarak wasn't just your average magic user. No, no. He, along with a trio of magical buddies, decided to form the Cult of the Cold Flame. It was like a magical book club, but with way more ominous intentions. Their ultimate goal? Summoning an army of magic enthusiasts to take over the world. Now, in a world where magic is as common as Starbucks, you think these guys would be just another trio of mystical misfits. But oh no, they had John Constantine in their crosshairs. Our dear Tanarak wasn't about to back down. He wanted to rule the magical realm, and Constantine stood in his way like a bouncer at an exclusive magical club in an act of magical heist. Tanarak found Constantine's secret stash of magical goodies. It was like finding a treasure trove of power-ups in a video game. But Tanarak was no pushover. He tricked one of his fellow Cold Flame leaders into a confrontation with Constantine, like a master chess player making a move. When Constantine checkmated the poor soul, Tanarak and Sargon, the sorceress, siphoned off their fallen friend's magical essence. In essence, Tanarak was the magician with a plan, a taste for power, and a grudge against Constantine bigger than a Hulk-sized latte. Calibraxis. Calibraxis, the demon extraordinaire, had a liking for taking credit where credit was due or not due. This guy claimed to be the brains or lack thereof behind the infamous Jack the Ripper saga. Yup, that's right. The demon claimed to have been the puppeteer pulling the strings during that notorious time in history. But oh, Calibraxis didn't stop at just terrorizing old time London. Nope, this demon wanted to have a blast in more modern times. You know, mingle with the elites and all that jazz. So, he pulled off a freaky Friday moment and possessed a member of the royal family. Calibraxis wasn't just a historical fanboy, though he had the power to make even the bravest souls shiver in their boots. That's Calibraxis, the demon who moonlighted as Jack the Ripper and had royal aspirations. The Man Because we're about to unravel the tale of the man, not to be confused with that faceless urban legend you hear about late at night, the man wasn't exactly your neighborhood-friendly sorcerer. No, sir. He dabbled in some seriously dark and twisted magic. This fella had a disturbing hobby. He was into marrying souls. Yep, you heard that right. Not a man of swiping right on dating apps. He went for a more permanent union. He strangled young girls, which as you can guess is a major red flag in any relationship handbook. 
Facebook. Now, our boy John Constantine wasn't about to let this soul-snatching creep have a happily ever after. When the man set his sights on his fourth victim, Gemma, Constantine and Zed, a fellow magic wielder, stepped in to put an end to this twisted matrimonial spree. However, things took a fiery turn. Just as the heroes were about to wrap up this horrific tale, the Resurrection Crusade barged in and set the house ablaze. Just like that, the man and his macabre antics went up in smoke. Burke Day The Curious Case of Burke Day and the Day Crew In London, during the Thatcher era, with the neon lights and some vintage 80s music, Burke Day was part of the notorious Day Crew, a group that put the bad in bad boys. Alongside his brothers, they were the kind of guys who thought crime was a 9-to-5 gig. They were living proof that crime doesn't take a tea break, especially in jolly old London. But as fate would have it, the day's criminal escapades took a detour through the pearly gates of the afterlife. A police shootout sent Burke and his brother Lucas packing to the other side. Now you think that's where the tale ends, right? Nope, not in the world of Constantine. Fast forward to the modern day in the world of techno music and edgy fashion, Adam Day, once a brother of crime turned priest, used some nifty spells to resurrect Burke, giving him a new lease on life. But get this, he popped Burke's essence into the body of Margaret Ames, who had her own run-in with Constantine and was now a bit of a magic magnet. Burke Day was back in action, but in a new skit, what happened next is a story for another day. British Boys British Boys, a not-so-charming gang from the late 80s in London, meet the British Boys, a gang with a knack for being the neighborhood nuisances, taking vandalism and moderate violence to a whole new level. These blokes were the kind you'd want to avoid at all costs during a night out at the local pub. Nergal, the mastermind of demonic mischief, had plans in the works. He saw potential in these lads. Colonel, Keith, Kenny, and Wayne had decided to turn them into something far more sinister. Iron Fist, the Avenger was born, a creation that would make Frankenstein raise an eyebrow. We discussed this creature earlier. Ghouls. Next in line is Ghouls. Oh boy, we're diving into the afterlife buffet. These fellas are soul-hungry food critics of the supernatural world. If you're on the road to the great beyond, cruising towards your afterlife destination, and suddenly these ghouls pop up on the spectral radar, they're not just waving hello, they're trying to snack on your soul. In one corner of the vast Arrowverse multiverse Earth-1, a fallen angel named Imogen decided to play divine chef. She got her hands on the soul pastor Zachary's soul, to be precise, and revived it. It all seemed fine and dandy until Zachary started healing folks with the father, courtesy of Imogen. The catch? Those healed souls turned into ghouls, but fear not, John Constantine and the angelic Manny stepped in, wrangling these unruly ghouls and restoring the supernatural order. These ghouls aren't just lurking in the shadows, they've got superhuman strength, speed and reflexes. They're like the Usain Bolts of the afterlife, sprinting to make a soul sandwich out of unsuspecting wanderers. Antichrist Antichrist, a true family affair of the demonic kind. So, this little devil's lineage is quite the mix. A demon named Fuck Pig and a human gangster, Harry Cooper, decided to have a baby. Well, technically, the demon possessed Harry's son, Ronnie, making things all sorts of complicated. Constantine got in the middle of this unholy family reunion when he was forced to seal the demon inside Ronnie's body to bring the boy back to life. However, seals don't last forever, and over time, the demon broke free creating a hellish plan to impregnate Harry with a demon-human hybrid, the Antichrist. The demon succeeded in summoning this devilish kiddo, but our man Constantine was there to save the day. With nerves of steel, he stood up to the demon, brandishing an axe like he was auditioning for a supernatural lumberjack reality show. He then proceeded to give that Antichrist a real execution. Powers? Uh, you bet! Unique physiology is the demon's game, but in the end, not even a unique physiology can save you from Constantine's trusty axe. Marvelous Verdict We've taken a wild ride through the mystical maelstrom of John Constantine's adversaries. From demon-wielding sorcerers to creepy critters from the depths of hell, Constantine's face them all with a cocky grin and a well-timed quip. But what makes this parade of villains truly stand out is the complexity of their characters and the incredible powers they wield. These foes are not just one-dimensional evildoers. They have depth, history, and motivations as intricate as a spider's web. Constantine's battles aren't just about brute force. They're mind games, strategy, and a dash of devilish luck. 
In the world of comics, where heroes and villains clash regularly, Constantine's unique flavor of supernatural combat and his knack for beating the odds have made him a fan favorite. So here's to Constantine and his endless battles against the denizens of darkness. May the snark be with him, and may the magic never fizzle out. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thank you everyone. See you next time.